Hello, this is Kiwana Talk. Uh, my name is Ray Skaboria. I'll be your host for tonight's program. Uh, Kiwana Talk is a public information program brought to you from the facilities of WDHS at Dearborn High School by members of the Dearborn Kiwanis Club and students that help us with uh, the re recording the shows. Uh, tonight, we are very pleased to have as our guest uh, Richard Haskin. And Richard has quite a background in the field of photography. Richard, it's nice to have you, have you on with us tonight. Nice, nice to be back again. <laughs> uh, Richard, tell us a little bit about, uh, you were on the show before. Tell us a little bit about that uh, experience. Well, I was with my companion. She's um, a survivor of this Andrea Doria shipwreck in 1956 off Nantucket. And it was a luxury liner. She was immigrating with her grandparents here like I say, at the age of nine, and joining her mother in Detroit. Well, it was the last voyage of the Andrea Doria. Since then, she's, um, many years later, she survived, obviously, and she wrote a book for the 50th anniversary, and it's called Alive on the Andrea Doria. For the 60th anniversary, she did a film and wrote and produced an international docu-film. I was set photographer, for, and what happened was we filmed here in, in Italy and reenacted the story. Yeah, you got a little vacation in there on that. Yeah, deal. exactly. <laughs> good food, good wine. Yeah. And uh, uh, we've seen the movie. We've seen that movie. And it's, quite, it's quite a movie. It's, uh, uh, it, there aren't many. Uh, well, it was the first case where there was a sinking, uh, where a ship was sinking, where uh, photography actually covered it, I believed. Right, it was the first uh, live action coverage. And when I say photography, I mean it was TV pho photography. Right. And uh, so they must have had some helicopters, I guess, that flew out over there and, and took, took pictures before it sank, you know? And, and some of those were in, I think some of those shots were in, in, in the film. Right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it happened in 1956, and you are correct. It was the first live coverage of an event of s such, such a magnitude. So, well, now give us a little, a uh, little more background. Go back a little further. Give us a little bit of uh, the background of how you got into photography and and how it uh, how it's evolved. Well, I started in the 1970s. Some time after I graduated from here at Dearborn High School in 1970, okay, 50 we... years ago. <laughs> and um, after I got out of high school, I traveled a lot. I hitchhiked around Europe and North Africa, and I had a little camera. But then I came back and I started studying at Henry Ford and Wayne State, and I, st and I picked up a camera and I started um, just shooting what interested me. And I went on, I took some classes at College for Creative Study, and I wish I could see that guy now. We used to have these critiques, and I remember this one commercial photographer, Dick, whatever his name is, but he was, and they were critiquing my work, and he said, whatever made you think you should be a photographer? I was so mad. I, I was so angry. <laughs> I was going to get good no matter what it took after that. Yeah. And so I took, you know, I took some classes. I had some view, class, view camera classes, which are the big cameras where you put the dark cloth over your head and you have to measure the, the um, exposure beforehand and develop them in the pans of chemicals in the dark room, as we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And, uh, I don't miss tipping my hands on those chemicals. No, it's kind of nice digital. I don't think digital. anybody misses the, the developing side of the, the photography business now. Right. <laughs> they, they just hope they can get their computer down where they, they, <laughs> they know all the controls and they can <laughs> move the files around conveniently. You know? Right. <laughs> and I still am not great at Photoshop. I use Lightroom and, and Photoshop. But I, I sat down the camera for a while. I was married and raising a family. and was just trying to earn a lot of money at a Ford Motor Company here in Dearborn. And it wasn't until later and I got divorced and I decided to go back to school. I met all these people that had, had degrees and I thought, I was so, so close. I had 11 classes to go. So I went back to Wayne State. Of course, some of the people that were friends then were instructors there <laughs> then yeah. at the time. I could, I was the old student, you know, I'd get to class the first day and, and I'd have my um, books and they'd say, oh, are we supposed to have our books today? These young students in their <laughs> yeah. 20s, I said, 
I'm not the teacher, I'm just an old student, you know. So. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, so then I picked it up again and I started photographing a whole lot. And, and it was great because I brought a lot of life experience to the uh, younger students and the younger students could help me with Photoshop and, yeah. and I, you know, they wouldn't know what burning and dodging was. And I remember being in the dark room doing that stuff manually that uh, now you can do with a snap well, of a finger. Now, now of course, that, that's all changed so much from, from back, I, I never went through that. Because I've I've never done any of the Photoshop or anything like that, and uh, I'm no no excuse. I just haven't haven't done it, you know. Sure. And I kind of got away from photography, but uh, it's it's uh, such a, a, a complete uh, changeover now with it all being on uh, memory and so on. It's all digital. <laughs> right. But I, I've I've read uh, different things from different you know, big names in photography, and people say, what, what camera should I use? They say, the best camera that you should use is the one that you have. Yeah. So, and that's one of the things I like about photography is that um, you can do it for just documenting your life. You don't have to be good. We all like to look at old pictures. Some sure. are painful to look at, the composition and the lighting and that, yeah. but, but it's nice to have those memories, and so sure. it brings value to life, and it brings value to the people that we're photographing. A lot of things I like to do are environmental portraits, which are portraits of people in their surroundings. So the environment right around them helps tell the story of who they are. Yeah. They're like legacy photographs or environmental photographs, and I've done that quite a bit, and it's like bringing importance to people's lives. Yeah. It's a history, it's important. Well, now you, Brought a number of photographs with you today. Let's see, we, we still have our first one up there on the, on the uh, this is our reference here. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, do you want to start uh, kind of going through some of your photographs and, and talking a little bit about them? Well, what I usually mostly photograph are things, are portraiture, architecture. I've done some event photography, film set photography. Now I do media photography for the film. When we travel all over the world and, we, and I photograph Pirat and behind the scenes. Um, this is in 2013. I was asked to do a mixed media, participate in a mixed media um, exhibit in San Giorgio Canavese in northern Italy. And I had a theme. I had like, I forget if there's six or seven images, and I named them by different people. Like, the, And this one is called The Dreamer, the one we're looking at currently. There's a good friend of ours in um, Ohio that lives in a rural area. She's got a small farm. and. And she just fit that perfectly. This one is, um, I just love the lighting and the texture on the wall of this one. This one is called The Priestess. And this was on the set of this thing that my son Nick and I were working on downtown Detroit with this renegade group of filmmakers. Uh, it's a thing called In Zero, and so that's where I photographed her. This is I call The Huntress. So I had these different characters, they're almost like tarot cards or something. The Huntress, this woman was, um, this is in Reno, Nevada, and I had a friend that had some woman friends and they do like the fox hunt, but they do it with coyotes. And we woke up, she said, oh, I have some friends coming over, and we woke up, and she's in the middle of the low desert, and these F-350 Ford trucks are pulling these huge trucks, and these women that getting out with these big horses, and it was like the hunt with the, the velvets and the horns, and, and and that's where I took that photograph. Pretty interesting. Did they actually ever catch the uh, uh I don't the know. They're I don't pretty hard to catch. <laughs> they are. The woman who started just started in England, she was a stable girl and she got interested in hunt the hunt and uh, so she brought it to Reno, Nevada. <laughs> yeah. This one is called The Mother and it's a friend that I've she's like a niece. I've known her since she's three years old and that she was pregnant with her first child. It's a favorite of mine, and she's a favorite of mine as well. Yeah, nice shot. This one is also from the set of In Zero. It's called the Seductress, and I like this because it was kind of a sexy scene and the reflection of her in the in the mirror. And so that actress who's from Dearborn, in fact. This one is an urban farmer. I met this woman at Eastern Market, and. She was selling tie-dyed things, and, and I was down there with my camera and just talking with people. And she and her boyfriend had a farm on the east side, but I mean, it was like in the middle of a neighborhood, 
a burned out neighborhood, I might add. Honestly, down there, they could, you could put 20 acre farms right in the middle of Detroit because there's areas where there's no houses. <laughs> uh, exactly, it was just, and so it was amazing, those farms that they had and the way they produced things and, and then they sold the vegetables and they found a way to sustain themselves as well as earn you know, an income. And it just shows you, I just always feel like in Detroit, it wasn't just Dan Gilbert that brought Detroit back. It was, yeah. it was the creatives and the people that were thinking. And, and what you hope is that that, that uh, improvement in the center of the city s spreads out from the center of the town and, and, and some of that's reflected in the communities. Sure. Um, you know. And of course, the more people that are working, that, that will have some, that will tend to have that effect. All right. Yeah. We'll go to the next one. Good oak. And this one is called the Seraphic Being. It was a woman, she was, uh, Seraphim is a high order of angel. And she was, her role was a Seraphic Being. And it's, I like the contrast of the, just the white, angelic, pure, clean, in this greasy, by these motors, in this <laughs> burned out area of Detroit where we filmed a lot. So those were my representations for, um, for that exhibit. Well, Pierrette and I had this idea. She's from Turin, Italy, originally, near the um, that's northern foot of the Italy, Alps. That's isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah. She's near the foot of the Alps in a little okay. village called Pranzolito. Well, she always had this idea of what it would be like if Detroit and Italy, if we had an exchange of creatives. Well, the more I dug into it, the more I found out Detroit and Turin, Italy, are sister cities. Fiat was founded in... Um, Turin, and in Detroit, we have the automotive industry there. We found more and more comparisons. So because of this uh, program, Detour, we wanted to create, we thought, well, we could have different people represent the different arts, and it could be an um, economic boom f also for both areas. So the first, the first um, project of, of this program was called Art Within Art, from Detroit to it, from Italy to Detroit, and vice versa. And what I did was I photographed the influences of Italian Americans and Italians on the Detroit area. Well, Dr. David DeChiera, who founded the Michigan Opera Theater, and he just passed away last year, unfortunately. I did this portrait of him because he is an Italian American that contributed a lot to the area. He's a very he loved this portrait. I, I made a gift of, and there's one at the Opera House as well. So I photographed these different people. My son Nick was helping me. He was uh, filming, and the Detroit Institute of Art gave me special permission to um, photograph within the photograph some of the uh, Italian collection. I'll tell you. Remember what it was like when you bought your house, all the paperwork you have to sign? Yeah, you have to do that. Like that before, huh? Yeah, with insurance. It's like going and, to a closing. <laughs> and I just freaked them out when I called. I said, okay. I was talking to one of the curators, Alan Dyer, and I said to him, he was out of town, and I said, Alan, so is that okay if I have, besides the prints that I do, is it okay if I have a uh, online? No, you know, they were, they, everything has to be just right and yeah. There's a lot of rules, yeah. but they were kind enough to let me photograph, and so, so we have a photograph of. Oh, that's. This is the state capitol. If any of you have ever been there, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful dome, and there is portraits. Well, for years, people thought that that was a Michigan artist because they were trying to promote Michigan artists back then when it was done in the early 1900s, and. Nobody knew who who did it. Well, a friend of mine, Dr. Jeffrey Drutchdis, he's a pastor in Taylor, he also had a congregation in Boston before, and he had recognized this man's work. Turns out this man is from Mon uh, uh, Monaco, I won't say it right, so I won't say it. It's outside Turin, it's a city right outside of there, and his name is Thomas Uglaris. So I thought, well, it was that influence on there that influenced the whole state capitol. And it, it, so I photographed, I went back there several times and photographed, there's one later that's more reddish. It was more the end of the day, the light was different. You can see the different portraits. But 
That was an interesting, you just learned so much yeah. doing this and the people you meet. It's almost better to look at the, the dome in a picture because if you look at it, you know, live, you might get a stiff neck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I thought I would be brave and I talked to the guy, the historian there, and I said to him, next time I come, I'm going to go up there in the top. He said, okay. And I drive, I'm driving to Lansing and I'm driving up to the, the dome, the, the capital, and I thought, why this higher up than I really thought it was? We got inside, and we took the highest elevator, and then we took some stairs, and then it was an emergency ladder. We got up there in the top, and I just said, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm too frightened. But it's beautiful, and those portraits are beautiful. Yeah. If you ever get a chance, you should go look at them. This is a gentleman, Rick Viani. He's a painter and a drummer, and he teaches at College for Creative Study. He's a professor there. And he was part of the Detour Project and his influence. We also did a uh, video that my son had done. And as part of the Detour Project, also he was invited to have uh, do a street art video of Detroit. And it was played in Turin at the gallery there, at a different gallery. And we were there, and they Skyped him in. It was pretty exciting for me and for him. This is Now, there's a lot of this work around that you may not have ever noticed, but this is from inside the Buell building facing the Guardian building. In the Guardian building, you'll notice that there's those Mayan Indians on the outside. Well, there was a, a man named Corrado Parducci who spent a lot of time doing, he made these architectural details for buildings. He needed those Mayan Indians. He worked a lot with Albert Kahn, so he had an influence. There's a building, I work at Ford at the Research Center here in Dearborn, in the old building, the Ford Engineering Laboratory. There's some different, I bought a book on it, I call the archives, I call, nobody knew who did those, those elements on the outside of the building, and I'm sure it was Tommaso Claris. So I photographed a lot of Albert Kahn's buildings, Detroit residential and commercial, and I've, I've gotten to know his work. I know a woman that created a, a video called, a, she made a film, she and another fellow, Jack Johnson, and it's called The Man Who Made Detroit Beautiful because in 700 buildings in Detroit, at least, there's remnants of this man, Corrado Parducci. And that's, that's something. And, and I guess after looking at what he does, then you can recognize it on another building. Yeah. I, you know. He wasn't but, the one that went right up there, but he designed those and then they put them on. They, yeah. This is Graham Beale. It's in part thanks to him. He was the um, director of the Detroit Institute of Art just he was the last one, the previous one. We have Salvador Salor Pons right now. But this gentleman was very kind and, and he was instrumental in me coming in and photographing that work. They, they said, well, we have stuff in our library, Richard, you can use. And my neighbor is a library in, at TIA, but they knew that that wouldn't do for me. I wanted to do it myself. <laughs> and yeah. so, and Graham let me, I did a few portraits of him. And I like this one all the angles, he's enshrined kind of like a halo with the window behind him and the eye is led to him by this r railing that comes down. Yep. So a lot of times with, with the photography, no matter what it is, it all comes down to, to lighting, the lights and the darks, the shadows and the... Now they say a good photograph is one that, a good like say black and white photograph, we'll see what my son selected tonight at the gallery in Dearborn. Um, to show detail in the highlights and detail in the shadows. For the most part, I agree with that, but at the same time, I feel like we all have highlights in our lives, we all have dark shadows in our lives yeah. where the details are somewhat obscured. So in some instances, it's good to know the rules so you can break the rules. This one was a woman from um, Alejandro Boco, and she's a student at College for Creative Study, and she was the last one I photographed for this project for this um, art with an art project. And she's an Italian background. And she said, wow, you, I, I said, how can I see your work? Because I saw it when uh, we talked about it when she was at the home of Rick Vian and his wife, Sue, who's also an artist. So, well, we're taking down the show at CCS tomorrow. You can come down there. So I'm going down on 94. And I want it to be a nice portrait. I don't want it to be like a, just a cheesy snapshot. So I'm thinking, God, what can I do? What can I do? So I'm going from Dearborn to, you know, CCS, and 
And I remember that I photographed a different professor there before, and I remember these these light, these um, patterns of the window, the design. And I also recalled from 30 years ago or something, an artist that I knew in Paris. And he did something similar that I thought, what if I had her work, and I hadn't seen her work yet, and on an angle, and that work will represent her face. We won't even, I won't even show her face. Well, we got there. It turns out that that's a portrait of her. It's a double painting portrait. So it's called The Conversation. Those are those solo beer cups that you drink beer out of, out of the red cups with a string on them. You can pretend, you know, play telephone. Yeah. So it's friend, her friends and the, the other one. As a matter of fact, um, in 2015, I think it was, Ford had a Ford UAW uh, Art Collaborative. And it was a national exhibit. And they had f photography, sculpture, painting. And this photo took best photo, and also I got the award for best of show. So mm, it's it great. That's great. This is um, Alceste Bufferi. I I included him because members of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra have his violins. This man, I was so excited to meet. He's a friend of Purette's. She's known him from years ago from her involvement with the orchestra. And he became a recluse. He taught in Cremona, where the Stradivarius is from, and all the famous violins, the famous violin makers are. When you say he taught in violin? Yeah, okay. and, and violin making. Violin making, not playing. He, he correct. taught making them. Okay, making violin. So we're going to go with this friend of ours that repairs antique instruments and collects them. And I was so excited to go to this house. And actually, it isn't a house, it's a church. And he and his wife brought up their children there. They're the, the maintenance people of this church in the country. And it's a beautiful old place. And um, he was so interesting. He was a recluse. He's, he'd kind of taken the, the life of the monks that lived there before at the seminary. Well, but he makes this beautiful work. And he makes violins and violas and well, cellos. Making violins is kind of that way anyhow, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's endless hours of, um, to, to, to build them. Isn't, isn't that right? I yeah, mean, yeah. It, uh, it was interesting. Yeah. So I went that night, we went at night, and I talked to him at length, and the next morning I'm thinking, well, where can I shoot, where can I, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night, I'm just thinking, where can I shoot this, where can I photograph him at, where I can, where can I have him? And we went in there, and he was just such a gem, just a real interesting guy, and he said to me, tell me, what about the light? I noticed, you know, if I'm working in the morning till daylight, uh, till later in the day, the light changes through the window, and so the varnish on the violins changes. Do they have lights? Do they have light light? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry, you're busy. Could you go to work? You photograph him. So this is a building on 23 Mile Road. It's called Architectural Stainless, built by Bruno Fucciarelli, and they do stainless steel work. It was so reflective, to me it felt like it should have a pond in front of the building, so I took the image and I flipped it. Okay. <laughs> so that's the interpretation of that. And that's my son photographing Sergio De Giusti. Uh, if you ever go downtown to Hart Plaza, you'll see the big ring. It's, it's by David Byer and Sergio. It's a tribute to labor. And the ring never touches at the top because labor is never done. And Sergio did the pieces that were like Stonehenge, the bow relief ones below it. Well, uh, I'm just going to break for a second here. It sounds like your son's pretty serious into photography himself. Is that right? Yeah, mostly filmmaking, graphic arts, but yeah, he okay. does use some photography. Okay, and then, and then uh, tonight, the event you're going to later tonight, m mention that. Uh, it's the 25th annual photography exhibition at the Podesky Gallery in the Michael Guido, it's right across from the Michael Guido Theater. Yeah. Ford Community Performing Arts Center. Yeah, and Nick, my son, was invited to be the judge of the works there. So okay, so he's the, no the ones that he's going to put the he's going to put the awards on them. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I want to get to the next one because it's it's this is about this film. I took this shot. This is in Genova, Italy, where the Andrea Doria took off from, and this is the story of what well, pretty much Pierrette's life, and. You, as you know, you saw the film, so that's a picture that was originally. And it's sometimes, you know, when you're making a good photo, sometimes you don't. That one, when I took that, 
I was taking all these shots, and then this boat drifted, and I just knew it. And I just thought, this is going to be the cover of the movie. This is going to be the... I just knew. Yeah. There's a woman who played the Countess. It was just... So portraiture once again comes into play. This is... Um, that's Purette in the blue dress to the left. And there's between scenes, and I just thought it was interesting because everyone is like in their own world of looking different ways. So you were saying that Purette went, uh, had to relearn her Italian. Right. And I assume that she relearned, so on this trip when you went back, she was pretty conversant with the She's folks. very conversant. Yeah, okay. She's, for years, she's been very conversant. Yeah. In fact, and I always bring a study guy because I used to study Italian, and then halfway through, I just. Well, we're getting down to about the the last minute. We can maybe hit another one here. Let's see what. This is um, a friend of ours, Ego Turismo, and this is where Pierrette played when she grew up. And there's a scene there with a priest and different people before she left. What's amazing about this is this director, uh, Luca Guardabaggio, who's a good friend of ours. And he and I share the same birthday, so we're all alike. Yeah. And uh, to watch him was like poetry in motion, to watch him play out this film. It, and it was it was such a good experience for me to be set photographer. Richard, we're, we're there. We're, we've used up our time, but we're going to put uh, your names on the screen. We're going to put your phone number a couple times on the screen. And uh, it's really interesting to hear about how you've developed in the area of photography over, over the years. Well, it's nice uh, to see you again. It was nice to see you again. Nice to see Christmas you, too. And Very nice to see you. We've uh, enjoyed having you on. I hope you enjoyed this show with Richard. Uh, tune in to Kwan Talk again soon. Thank you. <laughs>